Hello, my friend. My name is Byron, and I'm from the BJJ Brick Podcast. I want to thank you for checking out the podcast on the YouTube channel here. It's a weekly show dedicated to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and having fun on the mats. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Today we have episode 239. We have an awesome show today. Our special guest this week is Chris Martin. Uh, Chris is a Jiu-Jitsu artist who uh, had kind of an unfortunate accident uh, training, and we're going to talk about that along with some other stuff. But um, as always, I'm here with my partners in crime, uh, Joe Thomas, Byron Jabara. How are you guys doing today? Gary, we're doing great. Uh, excited to be on the show uh, again this week. And yes, Chris has a uh, important story to hear uh, and, and just to educate the audience of something that could happen, not real likely, but definitely... Uh, a thing you want to know to help protect yourself and your teammates and really people off the mat you're around your family co-workers uh, everybody uh, a lot to learn this episode and it could uh, it could save your life it could save uh, people you care about's lives so uh, I don't know how to say stay tuned other than that I mean you can't miss this Gary Byron yeah I'm doing good too I'm glad to be on the show this week uh, looking forward to it uh, it's a lot of fun and games on the BJJ Brick podcast but this week we have a serious issue to discuss during the interview. I'm looking forward to it. Well, guys, I have a off-the-mat lesson. Uh, I'd like to, to talk about off-the-mat and drag it over to the mat and tap it out and discuss it jiu-jitsu-wise. Uh, I'm building some benches with some, uh, I guess, reclaimed wood. Uh, just kind of some stuff, stuff my dad had laying around and, and he wasn't going to use it for anything and he wanted somebody to do something with it. So I decided, hey, I'll make some benches and I'll give them to my siblings. And the thing is, I'm not that good at making things like this i'm okay so i'm out there and i'm working on them and you know i've got i've actually produced one and now i'm producing several more kind of at, at the same time but you get done with a with a bench with four legs and you know what's going to happen it's going to wobble a little bit because there's four legs and they're not all perfect and the wood is uh you know 15 years old and the guy cutting it isn't the most skilled person so what do you do? You, you go to the hardware store and you buy little feet that are adjustable. They screw in and out. And you could, you could balance this thing perfectly and it won't wobble anymore. And I was really happy that that exists because I didn't want to make a bunch of wobbly benches to give to people. But I was thinking about this, you know, dragging it back on the map. The idea of, of having something that you could uh, adjust, like... I could have made those benches off by like a full inch. It would be kind of awkward, but you could adjust that foot the full inch and it would be stable. I think there are parts in our game that uh, allow you to kind of adjust everything, get it right where you want it, and then proceed. Uh, I think of a triangle sometimes, and you and you get it set up, and some triangles, yeah, you got, you got their, their head and their arm isolated, but it's just they're fighting very well, and you don't have that adjustment uh, quite yet kind of centered in. And it's like, man, I have it. They're not tapping. You know, I can't quite get the angle quite right or whatever. And then you think of side control maybe and you're working something and you have the time to really manipulate the, the person at the bottom and, and get them uh, their arms right where you want it or their chin right where they want where you want it and really kind of uh, go to that central point, adjust some things, and then proceed. And I think that making those little adjustments at, uh, you know, the bottom of a bench or at, you know, side control from a place that you're very familiar with. It could even be within the triangle itself. Not trying to finish the triangle, go back, fix some things, and then go back to finish it. Uh, are, are kind of uh, things you do as you develop your game, and you have certain techniques that are good for you, but you can't just slap them on and finish. You just you need to put them on, and then uh, have, a, have a period of adjustment, and then apply the finish. And I went with like a nice, smooth, uh, you know, oak-looking fish. On the bench. No, uh, I don't know. I think that's a, uh, something that I was, I was working on. And I just thought, yeah, you need something. Uh, some parts of techniques are adjustable to help you get them to where you need them to be. And that could be pulling on your foot. 
uh, in that triangle situation, or I guess uh, it's always better to pull on your shin uh, versus your foot. Yeah, I'm with you there, Byron, on the triangle, and you were talking about it, started out the triangle, and it just made me start thinking about my game. And, and what happens a lot of triangles is I get the legs locked up, I get the arm in, uh, but I'm not in position to finish. I always have to break the posture. I always have to control the head. And a lot of times I will have to reach up with my other hand and uh, pull on the shin, you know, to make it a little bit tighter. And normally that's what I need, but I never do get it right off the bat unless a guy just gets hit by a tranquilizer and just falls right into my legs. But it's normally I set it up, I, I get the position, and then I have to make some adjustments to finish it. So, uh, yeah, I, I like your uh, your lesson. I think it uh, portrays perfectly to jiu-jitsu and, and woodworking. Uh, hey, just a little heads up. We've been having a little technical difficulties. We we have Joe. He's been uh, kind of hit and miss the past uh, couple minutes, but now we have him on a phone. So he's here. Sounds a little different than usual, but uh, we got him back. Joe is back. He has you- good to be back. I don't know what's going on with the internet connection here in Texas, but uh, it's it's a little bit hanky tonight. Well, you know, we could use that as an off the mat lesson. Uh, you know, it's uh, we run into a little bit of issues. We have some internet connections, but we find a way around it. Same thing. Uh, we're on the mat. Uh, we're running into some trouble. Uh, you know, my leg starts cramping. I, my uh, whatever happens, and uh, but you find a way around it. You just uh, keep plugging away at jujitsu. It's a sport where we don't quit. We we keep plugging away. We'll find a way around that mountain, and uh, that's what we did here. Yeah, you know, you go for the hip bump sweep, and uh, and they're too uh, well based out, and you can't get it, and you go for the Kimura. If that doesn't work, you switch to the guillotine. I mean, you, you just keep going until you get what you're after, right? You need to finish, and you keep working until you get it. So true, Joe. So true. Yep, and the problem is uh, when we're new at Jiu-Jitsu, we don't really know uh, what we should be working for. And uh, I created a little audio book just to help you out with that sort of problem. Uh, and the money goes and helps support the show. Uh, it's about two and a half hours long. It's me talking to you about your first year of training. And uh, basically, I'm going to walk you through things like finding the right gym, what to do in your first month. And uh, chapter four is one of the bigger ones. It's uh, talking about different positions and how they work and, and a few techniques that you need to be focusing on. So many times, you know, you get to class and everyone's doing techniques that you can't really even understand or that aren't for beginners. That's okay. You know, they need to work on those techniques too. But you're going to see parts of those positions that still apply to you and it really helps you stay focused and, and working on your game as far as developing your your first year on the mats and, and kind of uh, a view, uh, avoid some of the, the miss steps that we could all take going down something that may be not right for us yet. And that's the the goal of that chapter. And I think it's it's a lot of uh, help getting somebody to not just to just train and do jiu-jitsu for that first year, but to really work on the right things. I think it does cut down a lot on frustration. So check it out. It's eleven ninety nine. There'll be a link in the show notes. It's about two and a half hours long. And I'd like to hear what you think about it. And if you're not in your first year of BJJ, uh, feel free to buy it for somebody that is. It'd make a great gift. Uh, Maybe a, a welcome item for a new new guy in your gym. There you go. That is a good idea. It uh, if you yeah if you bring a friend and you you get them on the mat and they've been going for a little while and you introduce them to the podcast and then uh, let me hook you up with this audio book. Boom bang, great success right around the corner. You'll have a friend for life. Yeah, I don't know. How to, <laughs> I was gonna say something smart. I'll keep it. I didn't have anything on that one, Gary. Well, we know most of the stuff you say is not very smart, but you know, there are a lot of people who do say stuff smart, smartly, I guess if that's even a word. And, and one of those nicely, guys is nicely like, proved right there. Again. One of those guys is Dwight D. Eisenhower. And what Dwight said, our re- our real problem then is not our strength today. It is rather the vital necessity of action today to ensure our strength tomorrow. You know, we definitely want to have strength tomorrow. Why don't you guys say so? Oh, absolutely, Gary. When I think about that quote and I think about jiu-jitsu, I don't necessarily think about physical strength, but I think about, you know, strengthening your game and, and having a complete game that's effective. And uh, it's true that uh, you can get overly concerned with winning the match today and, you know, uh, 
and not be and, and so you just go to your a game or just the one or two things you're good at and and that's okay for today maybe you want a match maybe you did good in class but ultimately you got to practice what you're not good at you got to spend time on things like uh stretching and and doing cardio and and maybe doing some studying there's all kinds of things you got to do that aren't as fun as just coming to open mat and rolling but they're just as important maybe more important because we're not worried about just being good today we're worried about being better tomorrow and the next year and the year after that you know joe that's a great point and it it makes me think of something we got coming on a little bit later on in the show uh our article of the week about positional sparring and you know i'll just touch on it real quick now and we'll we'll talk about it later but you know positional sparring you know i think is one thing that takes you out of your comfort zone and it, it's gonna you know it's gonna ensure our strength tomorrow we're gonna work on stuff that may not be our best and, and we're gonna focus on that to add a new to, tool to our to our tool basket as uh, joe likes to say <laughs> Basket, box, bag. <laughs> Whatever you put your tools in, you're going to have more tools to put there. Byron, when you were making your benches, did you have a basket or a box or a sheath? A sheath, yes. I keep them all in a, in a sheath. That way they're ready to go at the moment's notice that needs to be cut. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, this, I think this is, that's an interesting way to look at this quote. Uh, another way is that uh, working today uh, on the mats will make you a stronger person tomorrow. And you could also physically, mentally, uh, several different categories. Um, but just the, the idea that you're taking care of that older person uh, that is you by doing something that's physically active. As I say this, I'm reminded just the other day I was watching people grapple. It's rough. <laughs> it's it's all too easy to for me to forget how rough it can be to be new at jujitsu, and uh, watching two white belts spar and try to murder each other. Like, man, those guys! I know they're gonna go home sore. That's part of the your first little while is a little more rough. You know, you need to really pick the people you train with uh, very well and, and and train safely in order to maintain your health, especially in those early times um, compared to the way we I roll now if somebody wants to roll real rough with me uh, usually they're fairly new and, and I don't have a real difficult time not letting that happen uh, if if somebody's really good and they want to you know bang me up and injure me and and, and do damage I, I feel just fine saying no thank you <laughs> and, and and you know uh, you've worn out your training partner that is me just because I I don't I don't want to do that I don't want to get uh, hurt and not miss hurt and miss work and that sort of thing, but uh, just you should be putting uh, like money in the bank for a better health tomorrow with jujitsu, but it's easy yeah. to forget that and it's easy to say yeah okay my okay now my ankle's busted okay now yeah. my knee's busted and then you're just accumulating injuries that's not a smart way to train long term. Yep, like you said, Byron, put money in the bank. Uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. Um, another way I was thinking about this, you know, we talk about vital necessity of action today to ensure our strength tomorrow. You know, I, Joe's, you know, you got your way of talking about it, which I thought was awesome. I never even thought about that right off the bat, but that's my favorite one, Byron, your way. You know, when I first, yeah, no, I, I'm not trashing you, Byron, or anything, no, funny, but, that? <laughs> but you know, the first thing I was thinking of is, uh, you know, like healthy eating, um, uh, sleep. Yeah, And I guess, you know, maybe because I'm older and I'm that guy who gets beat up all the time. But uh, I, I notice uh, it, it's funny today because I, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I rolled this morning and I was telling my training partner, uh, you know, right after we, you know, right before we started rolling that I went into uh, the, the locker room there. And as I was walking back out to get on the mat, they have a full length mirror and I'm just looking at myself and it's like I got bags under my eyes. I look like I just woke up. And I'm looking at myself, and I was like, man, I look like I'm like 70 years old. I, I looked horrible. And uh, I didn't get a good night's sleep, and I didn't eat properly the night before. So, uh, um, you know, eating, sleeping, uh, stretching, uh, you know, just things to take care of our body to make us stronger tomorrow. I like that yeah, way, Gary. So true, Gary. That's really good. Gary, uh, so you talked about going in and looking old and tired. Do you ever finish a roll and have a – a uh, young guy said, "Are you okay, sir?" 
that's how you know that's how you know you've reached the uh the uh designation of older grappler <laughs> yeah, as soon as we hear sir yeah <laughs> I, I say, yeah, I'm okay. I always lay on the mat for a few minutes after a roll. <laughs> <sighs> oh, that's great. You know, Joe, we should write a book on stuff that us older grapplers have to deal with. I have a feeling at the end of the show we might. Yeah, but the bad thing is we'll probably forget <laughs> about it by the time, uh, you know, it comes around. You know, uh, as we get older, we forget about stuff. That's true. Yeah, That's one of the problems. What uh, am I doing here again? Gary, hang tight. My friend, we'll come back at the back part of the show. Right now, we'll air our interview with Chris Martin. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He reached the top of Everest by sweeping it and taking mount. This is also how the mount position got his name. He had to drop his sponsorship with Beats headphones because they would not fit over his cauliflower ears. Their stock dropped 30% that day. He wore his unwashed gi to a blind date. You're damn right he got a second date. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends. I'm happy to bring Chris Martin back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. When Chris was on the show, uh, it was back in late 2015. He was working uh, with BJJ for Change. He's still working with that, but a lot has happened between now and then. Uh, with Chris, and he's got some uh, got kind of a crazy journey he's gone through, and he wants to share that. And I'm I'm happy to have him here. And it's definitely uh, not just the the BJ for change. You also come with a safety message. Chris, welcome back to the show. Hey Byron, how are you? Thank you. I'm doing good. Uh, having a, having a good time here, and and thrilled to get you back on. And and I think this will be a, a a valuable lesson for people to to take away something. And this could be something that could affect, you know, you personally as you're listening or uh, possibly a teammate, but just being aware of of what what you're talking about today. Um, Your students, it could be your students, it could be your kids, it could be, you know, anybody, it could be non-jujitsu related as well. So, So Chris, you had, what we're talking about here, you had a stroke on the mats. Um, Tell me that story. Okay, so let's let's cut right to the chase, obviously, because it happened in August of 2017. Uh, here we are, April, you know, uh, we're, you and I are having this conversation about April, and uh, so that's about eight months later. Um, so I'm going to give you the long and the short of it, and I have articles written. Um, I've just started to publish some articles on Medium and uh, other publications to discuss what happened because it happened so fast. Um, and then anytime an accident happens like this, you you don't think about any of this stuff up until the accident, obviously. And then afterwards, it's just like trying to piece things together and like put put it all together to figure out exactly what happened, you know, following up with doctors. So Um, I've been documenting this whole journey because I'm not the only one that something like this has happened to. So let me give you the the short version of this story. Um, Most most practitioners are probably not aware of it, but we have the potential risk of dissecting our carotid arteries, which a simple way to term that would be having our arteries potentially form a tear. <clears throat> so Byron, let me ask you the question. Um, just stepping it back. Do you, now that I said that, you know, your carotid arteries can tear, would you see jujitsu as a sport that the carotid arteries are under a lot of pressure at times? Yeah, at, definitely at times it, it, uh, you know, your neck's under pressure. It's getting um, <laughs> just the simple fact alone. As occasionally you come home and you have these gi marks on your neck from uh, sometimes a, a well placed choke, sometimes a poorly placed choke, which put a ton of pressure on your neck or my neck, and uh, it didn't quite get the job done, or maybe it did. But sometimes I get bruises on the side of my neck from the pressure that's put there. Yeah. Sure. So I guess what I'm trying to like the the point I'm trying to make to people is that 
if you really step back and think about it, and I'm guilty as charged because I never step back to think about it. I first of all, I'll, I'll tell you, I never thought that you could tear your carotid. So I thought they were armor. You know what I mean? Um, so, um, but compared to soccer or basketball or football, I think jujitsu is probably one of the highest sports on the list. If you would, if you were a doctor and you had to step back and think about it, and say, huh? Which sport has the highest probability of carrying a karate? I would probably say Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, maybe wrestling. Um, what else? I, I, I don't know. But the point is, is I had been uh, I had a tear on my carotid artery on the left side. Um, I did not know that it was torn. How long the doctor says it could have been torn? Might have been a few weeks. It could have been longer. Um, and, uh, what happened that day in August was, um, just like anybody else, you know, sometimes you don't feel good when you, when you go to practice, but it's Friday afternoon and your team is there and you've got a great coach there and you want to learn and you want to be better. You just go on the mats anyway. Right. And we train because we get through it. That's what we do. And that was that day. That was my mentality. I was rolling with one of my teammates, Rob Smith. He's a professional MMA guy, a pro, a pro, a former professional MMA fighter, big time wrestler in Wisconsin, and really working his uh, north south chokes right now. He's a bigger guy, um, and that day he was just absolutely throwing me around like a rag doll, and I, I, I was just not feeling myself. And he even said to me after the accident, he goes, you know, that day that you, you just didn't feel like yourself, but I, I just couldn't, I just wasn't, I, I wasn't myself on the mat. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I felt that day like I had um, strep throat, maybe, um, allergies it could be, but you know, you never know in Wisconsin, like, you know, you can get, it, it, in August in Wisconsin, like you can get uh, confused, like, do I have strep or is it just allergies? And, and I, to be honest, I haven't gotten strep in like over 10 years. So, um, I, I, I kind of knew something was wrong that whole week prior to the accident, like something was wrong, but it, but it wasn't any, like, you know what I mean? Like I never thought it would be a, Oh, it's a torn carotid artery. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was how I felt was, and I was dry, you know, I would, I would like, you know how you put like your finger on your neck, in Jiu Jitsu, your neck's always tight. So, you know, you're putting your, your finger on, on your neck mus muscles and you hope that it, like you push a little pressure into it and then the muscles relax and you feel okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was, I had like the weird pain on the left side of my jaw, underneath my jaw. And I was kind of like digging in there, like. Am I hitting the pressure point? And every time I hit it, it would like relieve a little pain and then I would let go of it. And it was like inside my mouth, it was like only half of my jaw felt like kind of strep throat-ish. It wasn't the whole it wasn't the whole jaw. So I thought that was kind of weird. And my eleven year old was in the back seat and I told her, I'm like, I was digging at it. I'm like, man, I go, Izzy, I'm like, something's just not right. She's like, because I talk to my kids, you know, when I drive, like we just talk, you know, and I'm, I talk out loud, just like I talk to any, you know, anybody. And I was like, yeah, my, something's just not right. I don't know. And is, you know, what is she going to say? <laughs> you know, but I was just talking out loud. But she's the one, the reason I bring that up is because she's the one that brought it up after the accident and said, Dad, remember when we were in the car? And I'm like, that's right. I totally do remember that. Um, so, um, anyways. The the left side, yeah, something wasn't right with me all week. I felt sick. I I felt ill. I wasn't myself. Um, I'm not I'm not a headache guy, so I I really don't get like headaches like I've heard other people talk about. So I I wasn't getting any of those symptoms. Um, you know, looking back, and I, and I don't remember for sure, but I meant I I do remember looking back and and, and again. Time just goes, you know what I mean? Because after you have a stroke, like life keeps going, like it doesn't stop for you. And I have businesses that run and, you know, going to speaks there. It's just been hell, you know, but you just do it because you have to, you know, get through it. Um, but, you know, looking back, you, you do remember times 
every once in a while. And, and during that month, month, like there was, um, there was times where I, I didn't feel myself. Um, I remember one day I did look in the mirror and uh, on the right side of my face, um, I've had two eye injuries that have kept me out of jiu-jitsu because I've gotten one was a mixed, a mix, a misdiagnosis. I thought I had, uh, something cut in my eye, but it was actually, um, what the hell do they call it? Uh, not a tumor, but like, a, um, um, uh, I, I can't remember, but what? like, uh, like something on, like, like something on your eye that, um, like I, I thought my eye was scratched okay. and I, it like, I went two weeks and it wasn't healing. Like I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't see, like, this is a long time ago. Okay, but it was um, – I'll, I'll think about it. But um, it's not a cyst, not a tumor, but it was like a, when you, you're – like when you're – it was, it was inflamed. I was mis- – long story short, I was misdiagnosed by the doctors. I was, I, was, I was out of work for like six weeks because of this thing. Literally couldn't open my eyes. It was hell. And then after that, uh, probably like you know three months later, I was training at Ben Rothwell's in Kenosha and – I ended up going for a knee bar on somebody and put the guy's toe into my eye. So I've had two eye accidents on this on the right eye. So my right eye is already blurry. And I but remember I remember one day like I was looking in the mirror and I was like, man, dude, your right eye is really droopy a little bit today. And to me, I was just thinking like, oh, it's just because of the eye injury because it always kind of looked a little bit droopy after the two injuries. Um, but. <sighs> Uh, so let's get back to the story. What happened was torn crowded on the left side. Rob Smith throws me in a um, north south choke, and um, I'm I'm not tapping because I can breathe on my left side because he's got the right side carotid. If that makes any sense, if it's a north south choke, he's got his right bicep on my right carotid. Sure, <clears throat> and he's squeezing that. That's completely cut off because he's a big big dude. And uh, he adjusted, and I, I usually I would hold out, and then I would wait for him because yeah, I would wait for him to transition to like you know a side control or knee on stomach because he doesn't think he has the choke. And that day he, we've got Mark Lehman here now teaching us jujitsu, so everything has just like completely changed. So like this time Lehman was sitting there, and Rod had been working with Lehman on on um, you know we've been working a lot of you know, bath chokes, um, rear naked chokes. I mean, the whole, the whole month prior to the accident, Byron, um, that's all we were working on is back take drills. So Mark's philosophy on the back is really interesting. It's, you're going to kill the, you're going to kill the neck in the transition, which basically means that as you're taking the back, you're also attacking the neck. So as the hooks are going in, um, that's what the practitioner is thinking about. And at the same time, those hooks are going in and they're thinking about the hooks, the, you're attacking the neck and you're finishing with the rear naked choke. So that was like, he was that whole month before in August. That's all that we were did. He had me working on. Uh, there's another guy coming in from out of town to do privates with him, And that's, he and I would just go back and forth attacking each other's necks in transition, get out, et cetera, et cetera. And that went on for a whole month. Anyways, it was either that, it was either during that or it was, it's the punch chokes because I don't know, it's, it's though, that was what we were working on a lot that whole month. Um, so anyways, long story short, Rob doesn't transition. I'm holding my, his left hand away from my left carotid artery and I'm breathing, I'm breathing, I'm breathing. Then all of a sudden, I'm like, "Come on, Rob, you got to transition." But I'm, I'm not, I'm not moving either. I'm, but I'm thinking about waiting for Rob to transition. Next thing you know, Rob just let go of me, and he stood up and he looked, he looked over me, and he, mind you, my eyes are wide open and I'm staring right at him, and he goes, "You were out, you were out," and I go, and I go, I, I go to say. I was going to say I wasn't out, but I instead what came out of my mouth was rrr, rrr, rrr. 
And I was like, holy shit. I'm thinking to myself, what? I can't talk? And then I was like, and then next thing you know, like Rob's trying to like pick up my feet and like get uh, air to my head and putting my and I'm and I'm trying to sit up, but my whole right side of my body is paralyzed. I, it doesn't move, so I'm trying to sit up, and everybody's kind of still rolling. But they're all kind of looking at me. Nobody knows what's going on. I can't talk and I can't move. They think I just had a wicked choke. What they don't know was what just happened in that moment was when Rob cut off the uh, right side of my neck with his right arm on the north choke, the <clears throat> clot that the blood clot that was sitting on my left carotid artery for two weeks or a month or longer because of the t- dissection that hadn't healed on the left carotid artery shot the clot to my brain. And that crossed over to the right side, which is why I couldn't uh, speak, and it's which is why I couldn't move. So I was completely paralyzed, and um, that's what happened. And that's exactly from when when my article came out initially. Like there was all kinds of like speculation as to like, oh well, any everybody has strokes every day and this and that and this and that. Well, here's what happened though. This was not there. Were the doctors, there was no. Um, plaque buildup. It wasn't because I'm a, um, um, you know, a white belt with that. You know, when Chris Martin was a white belt ten years ago, he was 225 pounds and probably not on the best diet. You know, maybe a guy like that, maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah. A little bit heavier. You know, when I was not in shape, but then, but now jujitsu, like my numbers are perfect. Like. There's no issues with. I've never had to be on high blood pressure okay. or diet. Not. I'm not. It, I'm, I roll one to two times a day. You know, for the last five five years, especially. I mean, but I've been rolling for ten years. I mean, this is a lifestyle, just like everybody else. You know, I'm in shape. I eat good. I take care of myself. I don't drink. I don't smoke cigarettes, and I don't have any family issues. Uh, the fact of the matter, which people are having a very challenging time getting their head around is the fact that there was a dissection in the carotid that, and when you're di- when you're, cur- when you have a dissection, the only thing that's going to heal your carotid artery is the blood clot. It's going to, the blood's going to clot together to heal it. And what happened that day was a fluke, fluke accident. Only 2% of all strokes come from carotid artery dissections, but they are the leading cause of strokes in patients who are under 45 years of age. So um, reports, and I, I've done a number, there has been a number of studies that have come out about this in mixed martial arts and Brazilian jiu because after this happens to you, you start to seek at answers. And one of those answers was, you know, after I, the doctors told me what happened, you know, I'm looking at, well, when I was in the hospital bed and they're, te- and they're telling me like, you know, first of all, I could hardly, you could hardly, I could hardly type. I could hardly remember words. Um, so I was laying in bed. Like the first thing I, I go to when I, when I got my cell phone back was Google and I just started typing in chokes, strokes from chokes, strokes in jiu-jitsu. And I read some articles. I found a bunch of stuff online. But, you know, again, at that point, you know, I'm just trying to recover. Um, but uh, there are a number of uh, doctor publications and um, there are a number of studies uh, discussing it, exactly basically what happened to me. However, mine's a little bit different um, than a lot of these other stroke patients who um, they – mine, I was – I they knew right away I needed help because I was basically I, – well, I was paralyzed and I couldn't speak. So, I mean, you're going to call the doctor at 911. But a lot of these guys 
who I've started to interview and document the interviews um, and uh, write reports on after my conversations with them and hearing their stories. I am not the first person that this has happened to. And there are some other jujitsu practitioners, a good handful of them, that this has happened to. And their stories are different than mine because they go a couple days without treatment. And some uh, have suffered very severe consequences. Some have suffered death. And some have been fortunate enough to have just a little bit of damage to the brain, but, and are still active and, um, but it's all coming off of the, uh, ver- uh, the artery dissection, um, from our sport. And most, the reason I'm out discussing this with everybody is it's very simple. Um, it's, it's the risk. That, I'm not trying to shut down the sport. I love it. I have a business in this. Um, I have a future in this. I have visions. Uh, this is my lifestyle. It's something I, I hold very near and dear to me. Otherwise, trust me, Byron, I would have walked away from this, you know, after the doctors told me to. Um, but that's not, that's not my, that's not what I do. And it's not some, that's not the way that I would want to live. And, but what I can do is make my teammates aware of the risks, the risks that exist. I can make the coaches aware of the risks that exist and they can take the responsibility to understand that this is, this is a reality and that they need to understand what they need to do, what they need to look for. They need to put it in their curriculums and programs because if I'll tell you right now, if this starts happening now, maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's not, but, but you know, when I had my stroke, two guys had the same thing happen to them in in the exact same month within 30 days of me. I mean, that's kind of ironic. Um, but that being said, what I'm trying to explain is that if more of these incidents happen, then uh, our sport could potentially be at risk of you tell me. I mean, is I thought I read an article that said like, you know, people were being arrested in Australia or something like that because they were holding a jiu-jitsu tournament and it's illegal, like combat sports. Or I, I don't know what I read, but um, I just don't want to see any sc- scrutiny come on the sport because of stuff like that happened to me. And more importantly, I don't want any of my friends, my kids. I have kids. I have a, a 9 and 11-year-old daughter who practices sport. And I'll tell you right now, they have teammates here at, at um, Nova Gyms in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, this is a concern for us. You know, we are changing the way that we do business with uh, those kids and the way that we do uh, we practice our jujitsu, yeah. um, and not letting kids just go after each other's necks. I mean, and even with the adults, like I, I coach, uh, the Marquette team, um, which is a, a, a young college team. Most of these people have never done jujitsu before. So, you know, I'm telling my story to them. I am showing them, uh, how to be good training partners with each other and how to mitigate the risk or mitigate the impact of, you know, you know, you and I, if we train together, Brian, like we can work on the, you know, RNCs and stuff like that. Do I really need to squeeze the shit out of your neck um, to, to get you to tap in that little like, you know, but that's kind of what we do. You know, we rip on chokes on each other and, you know, most people aren't aware that something like this could happen. So my, my story was, very, um, dramatic to say the least. Um, and the way it happened was very dramatic and scary. And, but other people, the people that I've interviewed so far, um, these guys are going home. I mean, they're talking to their training partners. Like one guy, I'll be, I'll be, again, I would be releasing these interviews. I've already, uh, released my friend Ray. Um, he's out in California. He was a white belt, 
Um, that's already his, his and I's interview is already out, but basically, you know, uh, overzealous blue belts with a new white belt, just going for the neck, going for the crank, torn carotid, you know, three days later, somebody finds him on the ground in his home and luckily get him to the hospital. He missed, he has a lot of, uh, he has more, you know, damage to the brain than I did. Um, but he was a really healthy, 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 healthy dude. I mean, just ripped, jacked, you know, triathlete. Um, and, uh, but that didn't come from, uh, it's not like, oh, you're just an old dude with, you know, pre, pre, you're predisposed to, yeah. um, no, he, his, his, his artery was dissected. So Chris, just to make sure that I'm on the, the same page as far as yeah. what happens when your artery is dissected, um, I'm picturing uh, two straws or two tubes, one inside the other one, and the one that's inside gets kind of torn a little bit due to trauma or uh, I, yeah. I guess that's the, that's what we're talking about here. Is like uh, in theory, uh, one of the chokes or a accumula- accumulation of the chokes caused that little bit of a tear to form inside of your uh, artery. Is that am I on the right page on that one so far? The way the doctor explained it was there was two um, – your your artery has like two little – like there's there's like a V, I want to say. And again, I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah, neither I, am I. <laughs> but, but the way he explained it to me because he was showing me a picture at, at the la- – at my, my first follow-up visit was just in January. So the stroke was – so this is my neurosurgeon. So, uh, uh, Dr. Binder in, at the uh, medical t- college in Wisconsin. Um, my uh, August was my stroke. My first follow up with my neurosurgeon, which is him, was was January. And at the end of the appointment, he goes, he goes, oof. He goes, this makes. He goes, this is. You want to see something scary? And he pulled out the X ray after I got the um, the surgery. So they what they do is after. They take me in an ambulance after the accident. They rush me to the um, emergency room. Um, they put me to sleep, and they shoot uh, something called TPA um, up you, um, and it basically busts up the clot. Yeah, and gives you an opportunity to survive and minimizes the brain damage. So, and yeah, yeah, that that so. You had a, a tear on the inside of your artery, and over the course of probably some days, I don't know how long, the, but a clot formed over that just to help that, I guess, yeah. heal, right? 100%. Okay. Yeah. I, I was trying to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So yeah. um, while you're getting uh, jostled around or maybe choked or something like that, and it happened to yeah. be like a north-south choke, that comes loose, much like you would pick a scab and it would fall off. You could pick a scab on purpose or you could you know, bump it up against something hard and the scab gets dislodged. Except well, what for was, – yeah. What was, what was happening there though was that the right side was completely cut off. So eventually your right, your left side is going to try to do everything it can to get as much oxygen as it can. And that is what shot the clot up to the brain. Okay. So maybe increased pressure on that side? Uh, uh, well, just, yeah. Just, just in, I guess. Sure, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to, to make it simple enough for uh, me to understand what happened. And so that clot went up. And when you have a clot in your brain, it will uh, – it blocks – some of the uh, arteries, and that's a stroke. You, yeah, and, it is a stroke. And and so, like you think of a stroke, you think of usually older people, uh, you know, with high blood pressure or uh, high cholesterol or you know, a history of smoking and that sort of thing. You don't think of a younger person who is well, actively working out getting a stroke, but that's really that's what that's what happened. And that's and that's what. Um, that's that's the uh, stat that I rattled off just a couple minutes ago. I said two percent of all strokes come from carotid artery dissection, which is the leading stroke in its patients under forty five. So I mean two percent. This is two percent, and usually it's people under uh, under forty five, probably because they're active. Yeah. And uh, 
the reports that they write about this, and these are medical reports, they say that this is a potentially devastating and unrecognized problem in young, healthy Brazilian jiu-jitsu enthusiasts, and awareness is crucial. And that's not me saying that. This is reports coming from these medical doctors. So uh, that is, again, that's, that's the purpose of me getting on these shows is it's, you know, it's, Hey guys, it's not, let's shut down the sport. You know, this is horrible. This is the worst thing in the world. It's not, it's, 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 it's it's us to understand that this exists. There is a risk that exists in our sport. And I can assure you this, if you are an instructor in any capacity or a teammate, the last thing you want to do is to see your one of your your fam your teammates on the ground, uh, and then not and and not recovering like I did, but instead having some severe problems and being disabled. Um, and it and, and here's the thing: it's everybody's like, ah, oh, Chris, you you recovered, yeah, full recovery. And it's like, dude, the truth is, it's like, no, dude, I'm not recovered. I mean, it's hard. I some there's some days I'm trying to fit. I can't spell a word. But there's spell check. We have iPhones now, you know, so that is a lot easier for me. If I had to write everything, no, I'm not going to be able to spell. I'm a Marquette graduate, so I mean, you know, I and and I, I I'm an insurance agent. You know, I've been doing insurance and benefits for the last 16 years, and a lot of that time is spent typing on the computer, having conversations, speaking in front of people. Um, it, it, it's nonstop. It's, 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 and since my stroke, I have had to, um, get, get shit done and, and it hasn't, it hasn't been easier. And, and the truth is, is I am brain damaged. Like I, if you can't spell eight months later, um, and some days you don't, you can't say certain words, you, you have some a little bit of issue. It's not, it's not the end of the world, yeah. you know, yeah. but I'm not Chris Martin that I was before. That's a hundred percent. My jujitsu game is not Chris Martin who it was before. And that's kind of sad because, you know, I was really, 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 you know, and I'm, and I, I it's different now. I am training differently. Um, and it's, it's, it is what it is. I'm, I'm still in, I'm, it's only eight months after this accident. Yeah. So I'm still coming. I mean, I'm still in transition mode. So some days I feel like it's the end of the world. Like, Oh, my jujitsu is never going to be the same. Blah, 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 blah. Um, because the truth is, is like, I, I can't afford to let people sit and rank on my neck. I have a stint, uh, uh, about four inches long in my carotid artery now. And if that gets, um, the doctors say it's not a good idea to get that thing, um, to be damaged in any way. Um, it could po- possibly cause potential issues again in the future. And that's, you know, I've got two kids and I, I'm not interested in dying. Um, I can tell you the day that that happened to me, um, a lot of things go through your head and I, I really did believe that I was dying and, and I was, I was accepting it. And, um, I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about my kids and I was thinking about, you know, what my purpose was here on light in life. I was thinking about other uh, people in my life that have died and I was thinking about them and what they were. I was trying to, I was trying to uh, try to feel what they were feeling when they were dying in those final moments. Um, I was, I was, I was comforting myself. Um, and I will tell you right now, one other piece of, of awareness that um, we all need to be aware of in, in life is that accidents do happen um, I, I, I was fortunate. What did put me at comfort during those moments? If, if, if at any comfort, if, if I told you you're dying in the next, you're going to die by her in the next, you know, 20 minutes here. I'd probably and, hang up. <laughs> you know, I got other stuff to do. I know you would, but you know, but, uh, the, the truth is, is you start thinking about, you start thinking about things and, yeah. and you have, you're going to have to start coming to terms with choices that you made in your life. And I was trying to figure out if these choices that I made in my life were the right choices. Uh, one of the, the, the decisions that did help me a little bit, 
uh, feel comfortable was the fact that I did have a life insurance policy. I do have a life insurance policy that, you know, was going to be left to my kids because that's something that's, you know, important. And, um, and, but then I went into surgery and model modern medicines, you know, different and what used to kill you now disables you. And when I woke up in the hospital bed the next day or not the next day, the same day, hours later, um, I'm, my family's looking at me, I'm kind of looking around and they're, I'm waking up and they're kind of telling me what's going on. And, uh, the th- first thing that pops into my head is, you know, I'm, I put me at comfort, a little bit of comfort because remember just hours ago I was thinking I was going to die and I was paralyzed and I couldn't remember my kids' names. And now I wake up in the bed. The first thing I thought about was my disability policy. I'm like, dude, are you disabled, bro? Oh, I'm like, I got that policy. I'm like, I, w- I wonder what it pays, you know? And it, it, so, you know, you're having these conversations with yourself because you have to, you have to put yourself at comfort in these situations. And, um, luckily I never had to use a life insurance policy. Luckily I never had to take a claim on my disability insurance policy. Um, but I can tell you that to have at those moments that comfort, uh, is something that every family man who we're, we're all these alpha warriors. We don't think we're going to die. Okay. We don't think it's going to happen to us. We are the typical average males and these same typical average males. We are all the one of three people who are going to have a stroke, one in two people who are going to have cancer, you know, one of four people that are going to have some type of debilitating accident. It is our responsibilities and our family's responsibilities to have financial protection as well. So, you know, again, I know it sounds like a sales pitch here and it, really is because you need to buy insurance, um, and have that protection, um, because accidents do happen. So that's just a side note, um, from, I mean, the insurance would not, uh, if you did pass away, it's not going to, you know, there'll be a giant hole, uh, in the lives of your loved ones where you once were, but having that money and that support will help them piece their lives back together and help them, uh, have the type of life you wanted them to have yeah. versus uh, struggling to, you know, keep a roof over their head or, or being passed around from different family members trying to find the right place to stay. Uh, the money in that situation that's would make things a lot easier. And, and that's really and what that's, you're and comforted that's, by. And that's why I'm working right now. You know, I, I sacrifice myself and, you know, from, you know, I'm doing this for my kids, you know, I'm doing this, you, you do this for your family, you know, go to work every day and try to, try to create a, a, a community and, you know, try to make positive impacts in the community. You're, you're doing it for your kids. You know what I mean? So you're right. I mean, that, that, yeah. that put me at comfort, but at the same time, I will tell you this, as I was putting myself into comfort zone, um, with that thought of having the insurance, I realized in the ambulance that, that, that money means absolutely nothing though, because the, the girls need daddy here. And, and that, yeah, that, gave me, I, I, I went into a, a zone where like you, I took all of like my energy and, and, and aggression and, and concentration. I started screaming in the ambulance. They probably thought I was nuts. Um, trying to dump adrenaline to my body to like tell myself, like, I do not want to go. So, you know, I, 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 be- I believe, I believe that during that time of, uh, what was happening to me, I do believe that I did make a choice that I was going to live like no matter what, like I was, I, I was pretty confident that the doctors were going to pull me through. Like when they, I was like, just get me to the hospital so they can fix me. That's what I was thinking to myself. And, um, and when the ride was kind of going too wrong, that's when I kind of started to get like amped up and going to this like real, like adrenaline state and like screaming, like, like trying to get, like trying to get control. I mean, real, literally, you can see everything that's going on around you. You can make eye contact with people. They're going to communicate with you, but you can't communicate back because you don't know how to speak. That's what's yeah. happening. You're not out of it. You're not into some like delusional world. You are witnessing everything that happens, and it's scary because it's like an un- it's it's like somebody described. It. They're like, is it like a nightmare? I'm like, yeah, I guess it is like a nightmare. You know what I'm saying? Like, you really can't speak. 
and you can't like you're like even when I got to um, the hospital, like they were asking me like right before they were pulling me in, they were asking me like how to get a hold of my parents. And like, I was trying to give them my mom's number and it's just like, uh, like they were like, they were like holding, they were like with their fingers. So they were, I couldn't speak. So they were like, all right, tell me, okay. So is it 414? And I'd be like, I'd nod my head. Yes. They're like, okay, is it? And they would, they would say two and they would hold up the number two. I'd be like, no, they're like three. I'd be like, no, they're like four. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it would be like, and then like, okay, the next number. So it's it's four one four four. Yeah, Chris, don't give out your mom's number yeah, over the. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, what happened was, I mean, your speech is is largely shut down during the stroke. I'm Chris. I'm a firefighter. Oh, wow. I see people having strokes multiple times a week, and it is you could see yes. the look in their eyes. The, their brain is not working correctly, and they they know enough to know that. But they can't tell you. They can't formulate that sentence to quite quite right, and it's it's uh, it, it's terrifying. So that's definitely one sign. If if you're rolling with somebody, and you get off the mat and they're slurring their words and they're having a hard time even formulating a sentence, uh, one that we uh, use sometimes around here is we ask them to repeat a phrase, and and the phrase that we we do a lot is you can't teach an old dog new tricks because it kind of it's kind of a weird saying that kind of throws away, throws like old dog, new, tr- like something with can't your brain that has to, it crosses some wires and they can't yeah. say that sentence. They'll say, well, you can't teach a, a dog tricks or they just kind of mess yeah. it up. And it's like, okay, you are likely having a stroke. Uh, that's one sign is, is the, the problem with speech. If I'm rolling with somebody and, and they're not quite acting right, what are some of the signs to look out for? Well, I mean, that so the for so the other guys that I spoke with, um, yeah, you know one guy Jay, he the first guy he he didn't know he went through the whole practice and 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 it was you know it was whatever but the, this one guy Jay said that after the practice like um that's where he, it was, it was like you said, like trying to, like he was trying to speak sentences and like the sentences weren't coming out. He thought he was really jet lagged, like something's just not right. And like he even drove home. I I think, I think right now the best thing that you can look at is, is like you said, the smiling, like tell people to smile, look for the droopy face, you know, stick out your tongue um, then it's, it's not something that is, should be embarrassing. Like, cause ever since my yeah. stroke, like I'm, I freak out all the time. You know what I mean? Like I have like total PTSD. And so like, I'll be rolling with like the Marquette kids and I'll be like pulling them aside. And, like, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to smile. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, they're like, no dude, you're fine. You're fine. Um, but you know, you go through this, like it was a horrible experience, but, uh, but the speech is the best. I think what you just mentioned is, you know, um, engaging these people and making sure that they're engaged with you in a conversation. Um, like you said, somebody's babbling because they just got choked or something like that, or you know, some, they don't feel right and they got that lightheaded feeling. It's not like, oh, dude, you're fine, just go sit out. You know, it's like go sit out, but then when they're done, when they're done, like, don't let them like get off the mats and like, you know, kind of like sneak out of the gym. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, uh, Tony, before you leave, like, let's have a conversation real quick. Da da da. You know, Hey, how's it going? How, how was that choke? You know, can you speak to me? You know? Yeah, I feel good. I'm going, you know, what are you going to do? You know, just get, just, just have that conversation. If something doesn't sound like with the speech, something happened. It's that simple. Something happened. And that's the sign where it's like, okay, dude, something happened and I think we need to potentially go to the – not potentially. We need to go to the hospital because you're, 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 yeah. it's, it's not wait. They're, the guys are all going to say wait it out till tomorrow. That's what we're all going to say. Wait it out till tomorrow. It's, it's the speech I think right now. And again, Byron, I'm not a doctor but, but from listening to these other guys – um, talk to me about like how, like even days after, like one guy was at a barbecue 
and Jay was at a barbecue and uh, the guy said to him, um, uh, hey, it's, it's, it's good, good, good food, huh? And he's like, yeah, the patio's great. You know what I mean? Like talking about the patio, but like the conversation was supposed to be about the food. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, yeah. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put out his his um, interview shortly too, so people can you know hear more about their stories and and, and uh, but that it, it, the fact of the matter is, like I said, is is that we also need to be aware of the the way that we train with our partners you know how how bad do we really need to really attack the neck you know what i mean like yeah yeah chris i, w- I want to get a little bit more i do want to talk about training safely with our partners but i do want to talk a little bit more about these symptoms because i think that's where um we need to create a yeah. lot of awareness because it's good on the mat you know you've got your typically younger people and it's good off the yeah. mat you know you're you're around people who are elderly the same signs are are going to uh, present themselves and it could make a huge difference and you talked about somebody uh well, let's, I'll, I'll go to sleep and see if it works that is a yes. disaster yes you have you have about 4 hours to get these strong clot busting drugs into your system and then they can't give them to you and if you wait after that window they try to deal with it in other ways, but but that but like the miracle drug is off the table. You're not going to get it. It'll do more damage than it will right. do good. So <laughs> the problem is that it doesn't hurt. You know, we don't want to go. We'll, you know, we break my arm. Yeah, I'm going to the hospital. This kind of hurts like crazy. It doesn't hurt. You're confused. Uh, you know that sort of thing. Speech is a big one. Um, also, another sign would be like uh, like weakness on a side. A common thing will will be that like. You know, have them have them hold a couple of fingers in each hand and have them squeeze your fingers with the same grip, like squeeze my fingers equally, and they can't do it on one side. It's really weak. That's another sign of a of a stroke. Um, and uh, and you talk about the smile thing. What you're looking for is the smile is not look right. There's one side of the of the face is kind of droopy, and typically when we're just talking, you might notice it, but when you try to smile, uh, the corner of your mouth doesn't lift up like it should. And and that's because half of your brain, not half of your brain, but one side of your brain, is is not functioning properly, and that's the it's the opposite opposite side of the brain, but whatever, is is not firing the proper uh, <laughs> nerves to make you smile correctly because it can't get the exactly. oxygen it needs. And then the other thing somebody uh, somebody mentioned to me is the stroke awareness is is it's not it's not it's not just for the the person that's having the stroke it's it's for all of us other people who are around somebody that's having a stroke because uh, the majority of the people who are having a stroke like you said the word perfect is confused they're trying to like get a grip on to like what exactly is happening and they're like trying to come to terms because, and they're like it's like a total mind game like What's wrong with me? I'm just going to sleep it off. I'm just going to do this. I'm, like your, your brain is trying to rationalize with itself and at the same time it's damaged. So that's where somebody else is supposed to recognize the symptoms. Yeah. Um, uh, and that and, – and Chris, for you, that's – I mean your, your daughters are like that lifeline for you because – uh, hey, hey, if I'm ever acting yeah. confused and if I can't – if my speech is messed up, Call nine one one for me, even if I don't think it's a good idea, and and get the ambulance to come in and talk to me and get professionals in here because yeah, I can't make that exactly. decision at that point in time, and and that's you know you could be on a phone call with your parents who are across the other side of the world, and they could be slurring their speech and talking all confused. You could hang up and say good night, or you could say you might be having a stroke, and and let me talk to somebody else who's at the house with you, or and you could you could really make a difference from thousands of miles away just by talking to somebody and seeing like okay this person is not acting right, and I could tell that over the phone. That's exactly. There's <laughs> there's a big deal to know about this because uh, in all this time is a factor. That's why you if you have a, a stroke in the middle of the night, uh, that's that's tragic because we don't know when you had that. But if you had, you know, after you ate dinner, you were good to go, you're talking, having a good time, and somewhere between dinner and the next hour or two, 
you get, you're confused. Then we have a timeline, and, and hopefully somebody is with you to help establish that timeline, and then they can give that's you the, exactly the good right. medicine. And, and that's what people understand when you say, like, the good medicine. That's, it's a clot-busting drug that's, that's, that didn't exist in the past, but it, it does now. And, uh, but you can only get it within, I want to say four to eight hours. And if you wait like on the ninth hour or the 10th hour, um, then, uh, they're not allowed to give it to you. Like there's, there, it's not even possible. So that's what you meant by when you said off the table. It's not because it's, yeah, it's just, yeah. they're not allowed to, it's not. And if they don't know when you got the stroke, yeah. they're not going to give it to you. If if you go home alone, and that's I mean that's kind of unfortunate, and no one's around to hang out with you, and you're just confused, or you you know no, no one's noticed your change in behavior. That's what that's well, a big danger. That's what happened you know, to having, Ray Parada. So the first person that um, I did an interview with that I just I sent it to you, um, so you might want to backlink it um, if if you can. But yeah, Ray's yeah. story um, that is exactly what happened. So take a listen to his. Uh, his podcast uh, or interview with me that we recorded on YouTube, and um, that's exactly what happened to him. He was, you know, a couple of days, and he was on his own. And uh, he he will tell you exactly what happened, what to look for, what he what he would have done better, uh, what people should think about. He'll tell you how it happened, and uh, yeah, it's it's that's exactly right. So. Um, all, all, it, it, it's great to be prepared, and that's I think I didn't know you were a, a, a fire, uh, in, you know, uh, emergency. And the interesting thing is exactly what you're how you described it. Like it was so frustrating for me, Byron, because I just wanted somebody to tell me like it was going to be okay and like look me in the eye, but like nobody would look me in the eye. And I and now that I look back and hear you say that, like. Because you can't get anything out of me. Like, there's no purpose, you know what I mean? But, but I, I totally felt like yeah. I was dying. I felt like nobody cared. I felt like I couldn't. And that's a, yeah, that's a drop on the ball on the on the service. I mean, clearly, many people who can't communicate are, are able to comprehend well, and that was your state. It would have taken a few seconds to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Byron. I'm here to take care of you today. Uh, you've, it looks like you might have had a stroke. The good news is uh, we're going to get you to the hospital quick and get you to some of the best doctors that are around, and they're going to give you some been, really good medicine and, 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 that and help you been, out. That would have been really comforting to hear. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, so opposed, I mean, you were left uh, nervous. I mean, so I'm, I'm online, uh, you know, bumping around looking at different stroke things, and they use the acronym FAST as a way to remember things. Uh, and it stands, F is facial drooping. We talked about that with the smile. If a smile is kind of not look normal, one side of the, of the corner of the mouth is not going up. Uh, uh, the A in FAST is arm weakness. And and you could do that by just having them hey, squeeze my hands, and one arm will be significantly weaker, uh, probably. And speech difficulty is the S in fast. Uh, if they can't hold the conversation, if they seem confused and they can't uh, piece their words together, that's a big deal. Um, and then the T in fast is time to call nine one one, and 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 that's that is a good decision at that point. Um, you could load them up and take them to the hospital, but once you get the ambulance there, they're basically uh, at a mobile hospital kind of, and they're getting more care than you could give in the car ride. And of course, you're, um, it's always a little bit riskier driving somebody to the hospital because you're nervous and, and uh, <laughs> you're not able to start an IV. And that's like, there's a lot of benefits to call in a, an ambulance to help you yeah, out. Right. And, and that's all your teammates. That's that, like your teammates. They could have packed you up and took you home and, and dropped off in bed, or they called 911. And that is a huge difference in that, the quality that, of your life that's today. That's huge. Well, in my situation, though, that's the thing, though. My situation was definitely different because, like, there was there was no way around. Like, there, they wouldn't have been able – like, you wouldn't have been – like, I was in no state to be dropped, that dropped off at the yeah. crib. Like, they like, – <laughs> They'd have to carry yeah, you in, yeah. Just, like, you, you, it was like I was dying. But you, but what you're saying is going to be accurate for about 95% of the other cases where 
the guy's not like just laying there paralyzed and like, you know, on a, it's like they're kind of with it and they're kind of not with it. And that's, that's where you really gotta, gotta make sure that exact every, every step that you, you just said, that's the protocol. I mean, really, um, I would love to see, uh, uh, you know, in, in every school, you know, having, um, that list of what we need to do, um, listed so that, and, and part of everybody's, you know, uh, protocol and discussion. Uh, like I said, when, when I said earlier that this is, you know, we're changing the way that we do the business, it is going to be bringing awareness to this and not hiding it under the cable. I've had people say, Chris, why are you talking about this? This is not good for your business. I'm like, dude, I'm like, how can you brush this under the mat? You know what I mean? Like this is, this is, it's, it's yeah. this is got, it's gotta be part of the business because it's gotta be safety first when it comes to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. When you, we all have responsibilities now, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's be honest. Like Jiu Jitsu is, you know, fastly growing it's new to the united states you know and since it's since it's been here you know i think we can all honestly say that it's kind of been a a, a free-for-all to some extent and even with the tournaments and, and uh you know different schools teaching different things and this and that that's fine and well it is what it is that's jiu-jitsu but it is the true matter of the fact that it has been slightly unregulated and, you know, like I said, I've sp spoken to black belt coaches here in Wisconsin who never knew that something like this could happen. Um, I was, I spoke to Braulio Estima about it and his quote after he heard about it, he said, I, I can't believe it He goes, I've never heard of anything like this before. And then he, he, after he heard the story, his quote was gentle art, my ass. And, uh, I talked to Patrick Baton about it. He's in, he's Europe's, you know, first non, uh, Bra uh, Brazilian black, black belt. He in, in Europe has never heard anything like it. I talked to Luis Heredia about it. He had never heard anything about this in Brazil or anything. So, you know, this, these are guys that have been doing it for 30 years by her. So yeah. they've never heard of it. So, and, and either does, you know, you know, Dave Rosamarkle in Wisconsin, who has probably been rolling for 15 years. And, and you know what I'm saying? So, you know, 15 years, 30 years, and these guys have all never heard about it. So I've never heard about it. I don't know if you have. And uh, no, I've never heard of heard of this. But the good thing with that is that it's not common. We've all heard of cauliflower. We've all seen yeah. cauliflower ear. It's less common than that because yeah. you would see it a lot. You know what I mean? Like it's it's pretty rare. But the thing is, it's not hard to uh, uh, to know the signs, and and statistically, knowing these signs will help you off the mat more likely. More likely, you'll see somebody at work who's yeah. having something like this, or a family member who's a bit older, and and you'll make a difference there. But knowing these signs on and off the mat will will make these rare cases that this has happened. Uh, a lot more salvageable. Yeah, 100%. I don't uh, do uh, like the the striking arts that, you know, cause, uh, I, don't, I don't like to get hit in the head. I don't, I think that it's hard to get hit in the head without actually causing some sort of dra brain trauma. So I just, I'm not doing that. That's, it's, a, it's not fun and B, I don't want to mess with my brain. But I do think that this is uh, so, so rare as far as, yeah. you know, the, the, the many, many thousands that are training and how rare, how many has Braulio been in contact with? You know, so many, know. and he's never heard of it. But if he does hear of it, if he does see the signs on his mat, he'll yeah. react immediately. And that's what we need to do. We don't need to, oh. to scare everybody. Like, this is going to oh. happen to you. You know what? Probably not. But if it does happen to somebody you know, you need to yeah, uh, help Yeah, 100%. And, and I, think that's, I think that's a great start to to just keeping it at the point where we don't see this stuff anymore. You know, hopefully I'm the last person to ever have this happen to. But yeah, well, but probably Maybe. not. No. I mean, uh, we, we, like you said, we're taking trauma to our necks. This could cause a, a, like a little tear inside of our uh, artery that could form a clot and then it, it could come loose. That's 
It doesn't happen a lot, but it could happen. Um, so how are you training? Now you have yeah, a stint dude. in your neck. I mean, how, how do you train well, safely you with that? don't let them pass your guard, number one. And, and um, <laughs> if you do, you, you're thumbing the collar. You're keeping everything. You're, you're breaking grips off the collar a lot quicker. Um, you're playing Spire yep. Guard, Della Hiva. Uh, you're shooting, you're, you're training people to, you're teaching more, uh, 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 you're teaching more omoplatas to your students than you are teaching triangle chokes. Um, so then they're attacking more omoplatas. So then you're put in that position at a more frequent rate. But the thing is, it's like, dude, you just got to be aware. Like I'm completely aware um, you know, it, 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 I'm not in, you know, I'm not, I'm rolling also with people that I'm comfortable with, um, that, you know, are aware of my condition, you know, something, yeah, they, they yeah, still grab the big. collars and stuff like that. They, they kind of still look to attack the choke, but I go to where before I may let somebody kind of wiggle in a choke here and there and be careless about like my grips. Now I, I won't do it. And if I have to roll with like a higher level level person that I don't know who they are, I'm just going to have to tell them like, yo dude, I got a stint to my neck. Um, do me a favor and just minimize any type of choking. And, uh, you know, it, but eh, that's just, I don't know, man. It's, I, I'm at a weird, I'm at a weird point yeah. in my in my jujitsu career because I'm 40 years old. Okay. I've been rolling for 10 years. I've been coaching for eight years. Um, I've been, and now it's, I'm, I'm not competing. I have no interest in going to the worlds. Um, I have, I'm more interested right now in, you know, building my communities, building my tribe, building healthy families, because jiu-jitsu's had such a great impact on me and, 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 you know, unfortunately we're talking about a scary accident and, um, yeah, I, I hope, I, I believe that's just one chapter in this whole journey that I'm on. Um, but it, for me, it's, it's more about, um, the community itself, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And that's, that's, that's what I love about it. And, and so, my training is different now. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm I, I yeah. still feel, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, um, well, here's the thing when, when you're training, when you're training to be the, like just the best and you know, I, I'm, I'm still training to be the best. I'm always training to be the best I can, but in jujitsu, there's always ways that you can get better by training harder, training more frequently, training with, higher level people. Um, I mean, that's, that's just, that's just, it is what it is. You know what I mean? So, you know, for me right now, I I'm embracing this change in my, in my jujitsu to the fact that I'm a coach and I'm not a competitor anymore. Um, and, uh, I have nothing to prove to anybody, but myself. And the only thing that I want to prove to myself is what I started in, when I started this whole journey was I want to help other people and change their lives. Like jujitsu has changed my life. And if I can do that through teaching and coaching, which is, which has helped me through my personal growth and then help those people learn how to teach and coach, then I'm doing my part to spread a very positive message with jujitsu because I believe just like, uh, Carlos, that the world is a better place if everybody did jujitsu. And this is my way of helping spread that um, and, and uh, uh, getting more people involved and active into the sport. Chris, I've had a, a change in my mindset as far as keeping myself safe on the mat. If I get hurt, I will miss work. There's, there's few injuries I could, I could get and be able to, yeah, to go to true. work. I, I have been avoiding injuries successfully for quite a while. Uh, and my my biggest thing that I do is I am 100% responsible for all the injuries I get. It's that simple. If, if I want to roll with, with the big guy who's out to kill me and he hurts me, 
that's my fault. Why is that my fault? Because yeah. I rolled with him. Uh, if if I'm rolling with the super competitive guy who always gives me good rolls and he hurts me, why is that my fault? Because uh, he didn't understand uh, that, you know, yes, I was in a spot where I should be tapping. Yes, I would be tapping, but my hands are trapped or whatever. Like, is, he didn't under, I need to communicate yes. with my teammates how important my safety is. And that's where I think uh, you and your kind of your unique situation, having a stint in your neck, you don't want people pressing on a side of your neck at all. Like, like you started talking about having them grab your collar and you didn't like, like, I didn't even think about that. I'm thinking of you not wanting to get stuck in a tight choke or this or that. You don't want that hand or that gi pressed up against no. the side of your neck no, I've, very I've, hard. That's the that, first thing I, that's the first thing I feel for. And like, I play half guard, people like attack a lot. And I'm just holding with my left hand. I'm holding my collar away from my left starter. But Chris, nobody wants to injure your uh, your stint that's in your neck. That's I mean, that itself is 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 just crazy to think that somebody would do that on purpose. What's happening is either they don't know, or they forget, or they don't realize how uh, even that little thing of just grabbing that collar there or, or whatever is affecting. Uh, your ability to, to, to train. And so I would say, I mean, you could even hand the new people out that, are, that are, hey, welcome to the club, you know, thanks for joining or whatever. Here, I'm gonna, here's this one-page uh, paper about me and and my unique situation, and they could just say, hey, I've got to stand in my neck, and that way everybody who walks in the door immediately knows. And even that, you you know, you don't trust them right away. Obviously, it'd be harder for a new person to be choking you than uh, a more experienced person. All your teammates, they already know. Uh, the ones that know you well, I would, I would even, uh, if I had to stint in my neck, I would dye like a, a six inch section of my gi collar huh. red or yeah. black or something like, like just a reminder. Hey guys, that part is really off limits to me, and I can't train with this up against my neck. So if you're grabbing that or pushing that into my neck, uh, I'm just gonna tap, uh, and and I'll probably remind you. Hey man, remember I remember the dye. You know, I, I don't want to die doing this. <laughs> like, uh, just just help them train with you safer. I think that, that those uh, and good teammates well, will want to exactly, do that. Exactly, and, and that's that's kind of how I feel. Like I, I like I said, since the accident, like I haven't had any issues. Um, I have I haven't had um, you know my my training partners. You know, I, I I feel them giving off. You know, if if they come close to like a paper cutter or something like that. Um, so you know, I I I'm a, I'm a good I'm a I feel in in a good place with my training. It's it like I said, it's not the best because I'm not the same. I'm not the same that I was before. You know, like I was telling my doctor, you know, before it's like you can go kamikaze, like you can you 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 can work, you know, um, whatever you want, whenever you want, as hard as you want. Yeah. Put yourself in the most vulnerable positions whenever you want because in your mind you're getting better. I can't do that anymore. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I'm 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 aware of it. At the same time, like I said, I've been, I I do have an advantage. I I've been rolling for a while, you know what I mean? So, you know, 10, ten years of of consistent rolling and you know, I do feel like I still have control of each match, especially with newer people. Um and uh you know, I, 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 like I said, I, I've been fortunate, but just like you said, at the end of the day, it's my, it is my responsibility. It's, it is my fault. If this thing snaps again, you know, I have a, a problem with it. It's my fault. It's not the training partner's fault because that means I didn't either a, you know, do the right thing by, by making them aware of the situation or, you know, B, I, I, I was pushing my, my, my limits too hard again. And, uh, and that's, that's a choice that I'm going to have to make, but it's still a, a path that I'm on right now. And it, I, I'm embracing it. I've embraced it. Like I believe everything happens for a reason. Um, I believe that my game can and will get better because of, uh, my setbacks. And, you know, I've had, I've had, you know, really good mentors too, you know, throughout the process, you know, like Braulio Estima. You know, he's, yeah. he's been a, a, a tremendous, uh, uh, mentor for me. I've had a number of conversations with him and, you know, he, he, he is, uh, somebody who's overcome ad adversity 
Um, you know, he was paralyzed and he got back and, you know, months later beat Jacare, you know, the, who was the biggest target that he had, you know, the biggest goal he ever had. And, uh, you know, to hear him, you know, not only hear his story, but then also, you know, just to hear, like he said, he, you know, he, he'd ask me, you know, how I'm doing, how I'm training. He, he, he would just be like, you know, yeah, just be, he's like, just be aware. And he's like, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, just, just to have that like confidence, like, dude, you'll be fine, dude, you'll be fine. You know what I mean? Like that's that's huge. Like that's somebody who's done it. You know what I mean? And and so I I do believe that my everything will continue to go into a positive direction with my jujitsu practice, but also my 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 program and and everything that is involved with jujitsu because you know everything happens for a reason and, and this is this is a sport that it's all about overcoming adversity. That's what makes us better, and that's that's what makes us resilient. I mean, and so I, I do believe that this accident was just part of the whole process for me. Yeah, that's a that's a positive attitude to have, and I'm glad you're sharing your story and and helping get the the word out. Uh, so that we talked a little bit about how you're trained differently. We talked about awareness as well as far as uh, teammates watching out for each other. Any ideas about? Uh, cha- training just you suit differently or safer as a whole or yes um i mean we got to start with the kids right so let's start with the kids and let's look let's kind of move up again um i mean here here's the thing if the rear naked choke is 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 the most effective choke there is in jiu-jitsu and in self-defense, period. I mean, I don't. I mean, it, it, would you agree with me or disagree? I'd, it'd be hard to disagree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could. So, yeah, it, I mean, it's an extremely effective choke. So it, 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 it to me, it's the most effective because even in like uh, self-defense conversations, you know, we prefer that, you know, that or the triangle. But you know, again, I if I'm a smaller person, I, I'd rather get to the back and finish the. RNC than to, to, to be on my back and finish a triangle because you still have that. It's still hard to um, get your legs around a bigger person. Sure. Um, they could sure. slam you on your back, you know, so the rear naked choke is the most number one. It is the most effective choke in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, especially for self-defense. So we can't just remove that from the equation, but what we can do is, Again, when I teach it, I tell people, this is the lion killer. I mean, this is the first choke I show people to do. I'm still showing all my beginners. I'm like the rear naked choke. Everything is, is coming off of the rear naked choke. So it's not like I'm not teaching rear nakeds. I'm teaching it from the very beginning. But what I'm showing is I'm showing it from a so technical standpoint of how to finish it the way that Mark Lehman finishes it. And I'm showing them exactly how to lock it in. And how to finish it so that nobody's going to get out and I can show it to you and I can put it on you and I can let my people put it on me. When they have it on me, I'm done. It's you know They don't even have to squeeze. And because of that, you can show them when you get here, you don't need to squeeze right now. Save it. Save that carotid artery. But they just went through the whole motion. And um, they are getting that choke into their muscle memory and they're adding it to their game. It has to be in their game. It's the most effective choke. For any of the students that we send out from a, from a tournament, these kids are going out and getting rear naked chokes to finish the match. They get to the back. They get the choke. Um, and, uh, and that's the same for when, when we teach self-defense. Get to the back, get the choke. If you get to the back, get the choke. And, um, so we are, we are very high on the rear naked choke, but what I'm doing is making sure that the people understand that we don't have to continuously, um, inflict damage consistently. So in other words, we don't have to rake, rake on the neck. And to be honest, I don't know necessarily if the rear naked choke is, the most dangerous from what happened to me standpoint, Byron, I would tell you that what happened 
to me the the carotid i would i would beg to assume that it came off of a punch choke yeah because those those punch chokes hit those carotid so hard and that's something that we were that we were working on that we use it for opening up the guard but then we also use it for uh turning people in and making them move in a certain direction so that we can set up other attacks um so the punch but but even more than the punch it's the neck crank type chokes where you're exposing that carotid and that's where the medical reports are coming in okay and so the neck cranks the the neck ties the uh you know a lot of the like you know like the the heavy darces you know anytime you're cranking the neck you're exposing you're opening up and exposing that carotid artery and when you do that you're exposing your the the carotid artery is at a higher risk of getting that pressure because it's also manipulated uh, into a certain fashion. Interesting enough, my my business partner uh, from Nova Gyms, uh, he he is uh, like mid fifties, but bef- even years before the choke, he was always warning me and uh, about. He didn't like the neck manipulations, the head cranks with the chokes because um, we were we were playing around with uh, go-go chokes uh, that we learned from uh, Luis, Claudio, and Tiaga. Those were uh, Rothwell's coaches when Rothwell used that neck crank to finish off uh, – who was it? Uh, uh, I don't remember, but um, anyways, we were using those for a while, and, and uh, Rob Smith was was showing a lot of you know neck crank type you know chokes and, and darces, and my business partner pulled me aside on numerous occasions that I'm not comfortable with this, and uh, you know you're you're really exposing the carotids and the it's really going to mess up people's necks and you know we're trying to retain students the last thing we need is you know for for students not to come back because they're getting their necks cranked on by wipe and see here's the thing is he was right because number one that is a, a higher probability of danger when you're exposing the neck like that on these cranks but then even from like a, even if it doesn't cause a stroke you know, anytime you're 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 cranking on the spine, I mean, from a school and retention standpoint, especially white belts and blue belts, you know, who are just like overly ad- aggressive and hungry already, you know what I mean? To show those guys these neck cranks, well, that's what exactly would happen to Ray Parada in California is that he had some blue belt who was overly overly aggressive on the neck on the neck. And was going for the cranks, and that's what, and that's how Ray had his stroke. So, I mean, it's it's a consistent conversation with the students about the the fragile uh, ness of the neck, but then it's also showing them transitions on how to move. Okay, you don't have the neck. The guy's kind of doing a good, kind of doing a good job of guarding. Let's transition to somewhere else. Yeah. Where can we go next? Where can we go next? Until you get that choke so clean that you don't have to crank and that you can put it on and let go because you know you killed them, you don't even have to tap them because it's on so perfect because you made all the right transitions and were able to lock him down so that you can cleanly finish off the choke. And that's how I'm training right now with my partners, Byron. So my guys who are white belts, blue belts, you know, I'm I'm setting up the chokes that they're so clean that it's like they're they don't I don't even have to squeeze like it's like boom you're dead. You know what I mean? The idea that the neck cranks and those sort of things are more likely to cause that sort of a tear in the arteries. Um, yeah. So as somebody who's if you're stuck in one and you can tough it out. And Dude. like you need to evaluate that and say, well, is it, 
Is that what I need to be doing right now? And if and if that's, I mean, you do it once, perfect. You know, whatever. You do it twice. You do it like ten times in a week. This is adding up, and and you're not yeah. able to to heal and recover between those. And that's maybe where the the damage really adds up. So just kind of, it's okay to tap to a neck crank. It's okay to tap to a choke that's not quite super tight, but it's starting to bother your neck. And they're they're putting they do put a lot of pressure in on those. And even if it's not done correctly. Uh, it's it could damage your neck, and you know we all want clean chokes that that put people to sleep and don't injure their necks, but that doesn't always happen. It doesn't mean you can't tap to that and and not be you know, bothered by that. I mean, tap a little sooner on on the the if someone's cranking on your neck, and just you know the time to escape was before that was set up, not to tough it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's part of the evolution. I mean, most guys aren't are still not going to do that if you know if, if if unless they know you know the potential risks. I'll tell you here at our academy, um, you know, some of the guys you know who were here, um, who saw it, who know the story, um, and uh, you know they they will tell you they're like, yeah, man, dude, when people get my neck out, I'll, I'll just let them have it. Yeah, fight the. Uh, so, I guess an easy example for me: uh, take an arm bar. You know, you get me in an arm bar. My arm is straightened out. You don't need to hyper extend my arm. I'm happy to tap before you get close to that. But if I'm if my arm is bent and I'm fighting it, I'm fighting hard. Uh, but I, I'm more than willing yeah. to tap before damage is done, or even damage approaches. But like the time to escape is before that. The time to escape these uh, attacks on your neck is before they're yeah. locked in. Because, yeah, if I get a Darce on you now and it's not quite perfect, you don't have to tap. You know, you, you probably will go to sleep. But I can sure crank on it for two minutes straight. And, you know, maybe it would have been wise just to say, yeah, tap and say, hey, you know, that was kind of a crank. And just let me know uh, yeah. kind of what would, would just happen there. Because I don't want to crank anybody's neck. I want I want the Darce to put you to sleep, not to not to injure your neck. Yeah. <laughs> as weird as that sounds, people don't do jiu-jitsu. That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, th- that's good to, to think about because I've definitely just thought you know you look at the clock okay there's a minute and a half left he's not going to finish this choke it's but I also can't escape it I think I'll just hang out here and tough this thing out which that's not yeah. smart yeah, he earned that position they, they they set the choke up yeah it wasn't quite done correctly but you know it might just be smarter just to move on and say hey you got me let's let's keep going let's do something else and instead of letting Everybody. somebody crank on your neck your choice. Yeah. But, and also, I mean, that's part of the training environments you're in, you know, people, uh, clean submissions are, I think are a lot safer than the ones that are like on that borderline. Yeah. So, uh, we're going a little bit longer on time, but tell me, you know, like, give me a little update about the BJJ for change. Yeah, man. Uh, so we're still rocking and rolling. You know, you and I had our, our last conversation, I think it was back in 15. Yeah. Uh, right before we were throwing together the Dominican Republic, the inaugural trip, and uh, it was great. That was a, that was a really good time. We got a lot of cool people together, um, and we got some good footage from that trip. That's going to be part of the Netflix documentary uh, that we're doing with Never Any Light Productions. Uh, they're a two-time Emmy Award-winning film production company. And then after uh, we did the Dominican Republic, we went to Paris. And if you go to BJJ for the number four change.com, you'll see the, the video of Paris there. We're rolling under the Eiffel Tower on a boat with Braulio and Drysdale and all kinds of real high end legends from around the world. Uh, so we got that uh, mini docu, that the little mini clip. You can take a look at the eight minute video. There's some good interviews on there. And uh, also, uh, in 2018, which is now, time really flies. I'll tell you <laughs> that. Uh, we're, we're we've got. If you go to the website, we got Hawaii, Israel, and Bali all set to go, and we're going to be filming in all three of those states and countries. Uh, and that will be the end of uh, 2018. Um, and then 2019, we're looking to get to Brazil because we, we have to go there. 
um, and get back to the Dominican Republic one more time to, to finish off what we started. And uh, could we have some updates on them? And then maybe probably one or two uh, unreleased. Um, we we have we, we want to get out to Dubai. Um, we've been meaning to uh, uh, we've been working on that. And um, wherever else you know the universe kind of takes us over the next uh, course of of uh, 24 months, and then uh, looking to take it to production in 2020. And, uh, hopefully to be released everybody at, when is it going to be released? Um, I, if, if it all works out, it would be 2021. And right now the best thing that people can do is to go to the website, you know, put their name and information, you know, who's going to be on these trips. We've had cyborg, we've had Abraham Marte, we've had Rodolfo Vieira, Braulio Drysdale, so a number of a number of really cool, and then even even I think that's even cooler than just like a lot of the legends is the new up and coming progressive uh, practitioners like the 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 nomadic ID tribe. Um, they're a very progressive uh, global uh, Brazilian jiu jitsu. Um, tribe of practitioners who are teaching the sport in a different type of way and they're looking to provide their message and we're getting involved with them and some other smaller organizations as well who are who are kind of on the up and up as to bjj for change and what it really is 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 meant to share and um, really bring our sport together and our, our our group our community together as one one tribe Versus, you know, just different associations and whatnot and really tell the story about what jiu-jitsu is in the bigger picture and how it affects different causes that the different coaches have that they're involved with as well. So many of these coaches have more than just the jiu-jitsu to offer. Many of them have social causes that they're working on from a bigger picture standpoint. But jiu-jitsu is the main uh, component that is involved with those uh, organizations, the projects that they're all working on. Wow. So we can spread the we can spread the message together, and we can follow the uh, original intention of some of the uh, practitioners who created the sport before us, where they wanted to see Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu throughout the entire world, and it is on. on a, global standpoint i think there's nothing cooler right now like i'm that's why i want to go to abu dhabi and dubai i i want to i love what the what the uh the sheikh is doing out there with uh the jiu-jitsu and the schools i've always talked about that how impressed i am and a lot of these other uh you know in russia they hold jiu-jitsu up on a high you know bear bear crew uh uh that tournament and, and the, those guys i mean i've seen uh, Putin sitting at these things, uh, at these jujitsu matches. So this this is jujitsu is a big deal, and a lot of high ranking officials and military um, are all embracing this this martial art, and I see it coming together on a on a gr- global level, and we can all work together to to, to bring jiu-jitsu to a more you know uh uh forefront and and most people still don't know what brazilian jiu-jitsu is and and, you know going back to you know why we're initially having this conversation is about awareness and safety and safety i believe and i think we all do brazilian jiu-jitsu is growing faster than any uh, the martial art ever has it's going to keep growing it's not going to stop so these little these little hiccups in the roads with it, which has happened to me with my accident, let's get this stuff taken care of right away, and let's put the safety precautions and the awareness in place so that when the sport does grow to its full capacity, we're all ready to go, and we've got our you know what together if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's cool. We'll put links to all that in the show notes. There's opportunities to travel. And if you're in uh, the locations where you're going to head, you know, definitely should uh, should contact and, and, and make it to those events. Uh, 
Chris, thanks so much for hopping on here with me, sharing your story and, and promoting awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Byron. I appreciate it. I want to thank Chris Martin for getting on here and sharing his story uh, with the audience. Uh, I can understand somebody going through the same thing and not wanting to share that. Uh, you know, you really open up part of your life and expose yourself in a way that many people wouldn't be comfortable. But Chris is doing uh, that, and it's a benefit to all of us to hear that story. It's kind of scary. Uh, you know, keep in mind, super rare. You know, he's he's talked to, you know, many, many black belts have been training for many, you know, 20, 25, 30 years, and none of them have heard of this thing. Very rare situation, but something that we should be aware of, because if you're aware of it and you can catch it, it, it makes a big difference. So we've, we talked about the signs of a stroke. Um, you should know those. Not a bad idea to put something up that like that in your gym. Um, it could definitely save someone's life. You know, it could save someone's life on the mat. Uh, statistically, more likely to save somebody's life. Uh, it's a little bit older. A uh, family member, maybe. Co-worker, possibly. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very big deal. And when someone has stroke symptoms, uh, time is a huge factor. And so the problem is, it doesn't hurt. It, it's just it's just kind of a weird feeling. It's, you're, you're confused. You can't put your words together. But there's no pain. If it hurt like it should, because it should hurt freaking bad, because it's doing uh, some serious damage, you would go to the hospital immediately. But it doesn't hurt. So people are able to sometimes just ignore it or not, you know, put it off. Till, 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 now is not a good time. I'm busy. I have this going on. No, now is the time to do this because the you that's tomorrow the person that's you for the next several years and the rest of your life will thank you for the time you've stopped and went to the hospital and the the person that's having that emergency can't figure that out because their brain isn't working properly they need help and that's you today by learning the lessons that we've talked about uh, with the interview with chris so i want to thank you for getting on here and talking with us about that hey byron i want to make a quick quick public service announcement here um from listening to his story, I, I get the impression that it was a really good grappling match and there was nothing unusual about the way his opponent was grappling with him. But uh, I just want to say, if, if you're rolling with somebody and whether it's a, a shoulder lock, a foot lock, or a choke, if they're just not tapping and, and you know you're right at the verge of hurting them, for whatever reason they're not tapping them, to me, a gym win is not worth hurting somebody. If I'm choking them and they're gurgling and they're gargling and I'm just – and there's no way they're escaping, I'll just switch to something else. It's not worth hurting somebody for me to get a gym win. Yeah, there is literally no uh, value in in winning at the gym. Maybe make you feel a bit better, but you'll feel bad if you injure somebody. Uh, I, you know, last year I got choked unconscious several times in training, and every time the person that did it was apologizing, and every time, I, it, it is my fault. I didn't realize it was that close. Uh, you know, I I didn't see that happening that fast and that's that's real so this year i'm tapping sooner than later and and my goal is to get choked unconscious zero times uh to tap from chokes more times than i did last year i don't know i don't know what the number was but it'll be more i know it'll be more because i'm tapping earlier and some of those chokes i will have been able to escape if it if but i won't be escaping because i'm not going that far uh, as i was going just because I know that something's off on my barometer of, of consciousness. It, same thing with arm lock. Yeah, it, joint submissions. There's no reason to hurt your training partners. It's kind of a, a good training partner who will tap before you injure them because th- that's what we're doing here. We're not trying to injure each other. That's our safety mechanism. And if you're not willing to play that game and be safe, you're really putting your training parts in, in an odd spot. So it's up to you to tap early enough. And if uh, you're only somebody who's not tapping early enough, it's up to you to back off and say, hey, are you okay? I mean, usually it seems like people are tapping. The crazy thing, Byron, your goal, like you said, is to not be choked unconscious this year. It's crazy because my goal is the exact opposite, <laughs> to choke you unconscious as many times as possible this year. That's uh, kind of crazy. Yeah, that's, they, they really uh, conflict. But Gary has a good habit of letting go immediately when I tap, uh, which will make his goal very tricky. Yeah, it definitely makes it a lot tougher. But sometimes I just pretend like I didn't see the tap. <laughs> and that's why nobody will train with me because I'm not a good training partner. Yeah. So be a good training partner. Don't be like Gary. And take a shower regularly. 
Yeah, don't, don't be like you. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, you know, this is such uh, an important uh, podcast episode with, with Chris on here. Uh, do share this one with your friends. Uh, this is a good one for your coach to hear as far as somebody who has some leadership role on the mat. That way that the, they're likely to be there when, if something like this happens. They're likely to be uh, a source of uh, somebody who says, hey, we need to call 911. And people say, no, the coach you know, stands firm on that. Yeah, we're calling. And and people are less likely to back down versus uh, somebody who's brand new to the to the place or somebody who's a little bit more shy. Um, this is definitely one that coaches should be listening to. want to give a quick shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Michael. Uh, last name starts with an H. Thanks so much, Michael. We've got your Beach Day Brick gee patch and sticker in the mail headed that way. They may even be there by the time you're hearing this, Michael. I don't know uh, how quick uh, the mail service will be uh, way out where you are. You're out of the country. We'll mail these uh, gee patch and stickers anywhere in the world. Um, also, I've already added Michael to the Beach Day Brick private Facebook group. So next time we're interviewing somebody or something's come up, we kind of want to bat it around the community a little bit. A lot of times we'll discuss these things in the closed group, uh, Facebook uh, group. <laughs> and and that's always like just kind of our insiders. And a lot of them are Patreon supporters. And the other part of them are people here locally that we train with and we know a lot. Um, and so it's not a very big group, but they're very important to us. And Michael's a part of that. If you are interested in supporting the show, and what you're going to be doing is help keep this going, but really help us grow. What we're going to do with the funds is to make this show better, stronger, uh, help us do more things in the future. And and that's really what we're uh, able to do with people like Michael. So uh, thanks so much for that. There will be a link in the show notes to Patreon. Plays a little video I made a while ago explaining how Patreon works. And most people support at a dollar per episode. And we'd be thrilled if you would be helping us with that. Hey, you know what? That's not the only way Michael supported the show. Michael suggested an article for us to talk about. Very nice. What? And it, yeah, it's a good article. Uh, level up with positional sparring. And uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to dig into it deep, too deeply yet, but I really like it. I like positional sparring. Um, I like one of the things he says early in the article about uh, shoring up your weaknesses uh, and not always going to your A game, especially if you're one of the better grapplers in your school. You can always get to the position you want to be in and then grapple from there. And that's okay sometimes, but it also has the potential to, to uh, stunt your growth a little bit. So if, if that's you and your A game is uh, a half guard or, or top side control, uh, maybe do some sp- positional sparring for butterfly guard or, or something different. And it, it's a great way to open up your game a little bit. Yes, definitely, Joe. Um, another thing I like that uh, Alex said, um, uh, Alec is Alex Balding. He's the uh, author of this article, and we do have a link to it on the show notes. But, you know, positional sparring, it seems like every time we talk to a high-level person, they do talk about how they use positional sparring a lot. And what I liked about Alec was he was talking about his gym. Uh, I think he must be the instructor at the gym, but he actually has dedicated two classes per week solely to positional sparring. And I just thought that was awesome. I I don't really know if I've seen that, uh, you know, classes just dedicated a hundred percent to it, but that sounds like a school I would like to train at. And I think it would really, like uh, Joe said, help your game. You're, you're going to get pushed out of your comfort zone. You're not just going to spend the bulk of your time, you know, relying on your A game. You're going to learn some other stuff and, uh, you know, that's what's going to make our game better, uh, learning, you know, different stuff and, uh, getting better at it. And that's what positional sparring will do for you. Yeah, and, you know, as more experienced grapplers, we're able to cheat this. And Joe mentioned that you can always go to where you want to work and work from that. So if I want to work, uh, you know, side control and dealing with the underhook, I'm typically able to get to side control and and work with that. But that's, uh, you know, me grabbing somebody who may not be as experienced with me or maybe a guard I know I can pass and get to side control and, and do that. Do that positional sparring while everybody else is just rolling. That's been kind of a, a way that I could get positional, positional sparring in while I'm just, you know, training and everybody else is just rolling. But for a lot of people, if you want to work on your mount attacks, it's really tough to get to mount. And, yeah, you need to have those skills, but you, you may just want to spend the time and just work on those a little bit, and you can't get there. That's a, very frustrating. 
And if you, or if you want to work on your mount escapes, you let people mount you, and then you have a miserable five minute roll. Well, that's really not what you wanted either. You wanted a little bit more cat and mouse, a little bit of a, a play to the game, and, and, and build on that, not just struggle with that. And so that's you know really positional sparring is a great tool for everybody, and it put you in this the situations you want to work on. Uh, just last week, uh, you know, I've been working a little bit in my daily Heva guard. It is awful. I don't have much behind it, but I've been uh, you know trying to to develop like a base game of daily Heva. I had a hard time getting to daily Heva because I don't have the setups to get to that position. It's easier for me. I get to attain X guard easier than get daily Heva guard. Uh, so. Yeah, many times I struggle just to sit there and get to that particular guard to work. Uh, and, you know, if I had a good daily heave, I'd boom, I'd be there a lot easier. But I don't. Or if I partner up and say, hey, you mind if I work my daily heave guard for a little while? They would say yes. And they would work to pass it and I'd work to sweep them or, to, or you know, do something from there. And, and working those positions is great. That's a great training tool, especially if you're excited about a technique or a position or you want to try something or really fine tune it. This is a, a way to like turbocharge that and get the many, uh, you know, minutes or hours or days of, of time in that position because otherwise it's going to be hard to get there uh, consistently. And starting from that position, working it. So somebody passes my daily Hiva guard. Let's restart. What I do wrong? Let's try it again. And they pass. Okay, let's restart. With it. And I get a sweep. How did I get a sweep? Okay, this time try to avoid that sweep, This you know, and just working those positions. Man, this is a tremendous learning tool. Hey, Byron, something we do at my gym. My coaches are pretty smart, I think, and, and he comes up with some good ideas, and I think you'll like this. And from reading Alex's article, I think he would like it too. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he already does it. Uh, you talked about learning some tools from the position, but also needing tools to get to the position. And in our gym, if we're going to work on the daily Eva guard, which we have been in lately, coincidentally, we start in a closed guard. So... I'm in, you want to work on De La Hiva, I'm in your closed guard, and I do a standing guard break. I grab a, your lapel nice. on your sleeve, and I stand, and I break the guard. And at that point, you transition to the De La Hiva, and once you secure the De La Hiva, then we start our positional sparring. That's perfect. That gets, that, that's really adding two skills, is, you know, a skill to get to that position, and then you know, skills from that position. And that's really what you need to get anything to work is you need to be able to get there, funnel the match into where you want it to go, and then uh, execute from that. That's a great way to train. Another big one the article touches on is it takes the ego out of the uh, equation a lot of times. So, uh, you know, this, this blue belt has a mount on me, and I've been training with this blue belt since he started, this couple of years. He's yet to tap me out, and I'm, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but it hasn't happened yet. And... We start with Mount as the position we're sparring with, and he catches me. That's that should the ego from that should should fade significantly, uh, and you shouldn't be upset by that or you know super proud either. <laughs> it, it's kind of weird to talk about. Generally, when I get tapped out by somebody that I've been training with for a, a while, it, I'm usually pretty happy with it. I'm pretty proud that they that they've done that because. I will give up positions and then I will get caught sometimes, but I fight pretty hard to get out before I get caught, you know, officially. But uh, it does, starting in a bad position, starting with Gary in my triangle choke, uh, if he had an ego that bothered him, I know Gary doesn't have, we wouldn't be bothered by tapping, but if he did, it should be less bothersome to deal with that because we started here. I, we cut out most of the hard work of getting here. But yet, our triangle, my triangle, and his defensive triangle still get to be improved dramatically. So I, I do think that's a great tool to help take that ego out of play. And like Byron always says, your ego is not your amigo, my friend. See, si. yeah, check the article. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. You know, I, I'm looking at this thing, and he's got some uh, pictures on here. One of them is the old Street Fighter thing. Uh, that's kind of scary looking uh, legs. <laughs> <laughs> on there if you guys are there <laughs> that used to be kind of nice and now it's like whoa that's scary so uh <laughs> nobody will you want to get it unless you go there but uh, there are a, a scary set of legs in the street fighter game on the uh is it chung lee character i don't remember but uh yeah anyway check out the the link to the article it's a great article uh really cool blog by alec yeah, thanks, Alex, for putting out some good content, and thanks, Michael, for uh, suggesting the article. I enjoyed the read. 
Uh, want to remind you guys, we do have an event coming up. We're really excited about this. Uh, June 22, 23, 24. Kind of uh, a big deal. It's the first ever BJJ Break live action event. We're going to be doing seminars, classes, rolling. Uh, it's going to be an amazing weekend. Uh, June 22nd is kind of a, a more of a informal gathering, open mat style of training. Uh, we're going to be having great times and, and getting to know you guys and and, and, and training. And June 23rd, uh, Tim Sled is going to be here in Wichita, Kansas. He's going to be showing his jujitsu. He's going to do a kids seminar, an adult seminar, something for everybody. Uh, Tim's great at explaining things and, and really helping build our game in a systems-based approach, which I think is fantastic. Uh, Roy Lee Delgado, he's been here a couple times in Wichita, and when he, he does a seminar, man, it's a packed room. Everybody loves ro- learning from Roly Delgado. Uh, he's a UFC veteran. He's got the uh, legal and illegal leg lock apps. The app itself is not illegal. <laughs> you can still download it and not get arrested. Uh, but no, he, he's just a wizard at leg locks and you know i was able to to roll with him a little bit over the summer maybe it was in the spring and he's just so fun to be around and he's having a good time and just amazing uh technician and yet again his methods of explaining things and uh, performing on the mat is his teaching is is amazing so uh we're talking about who to get for our our first kind of bjj brick camp these two names were super high on the list and they both said yes and we were we were pumped. June 24th, it's BJJ Brick. We're going to be teaching you guys some jujitsu. I'm putting together some things I want to show you guys, uh, some of my favorite techniques, some of my favorite concepts. Uh, anything Gary wants to throw in will be great as well. A couple hours on Sunday. We'll be hanging out off the mats as well, You know, eating dinners and, and socializing. And uh, I don't know if we'll record a podcast in front of an audience or not. That's not off the table. It might be a little tricky, but we'll try. Uh, We might try. (laughs) I don't know that we'll try. We might try if that's uh, uh, able to be done. And I don't know. We're going to have a great time that weekend, guys. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, For the audience, I I think most of you know, but maybe you don't. Uh, Gary and Byron trained together, been friends for years, and uh, but the three of us have not met. So I'm looking forward to coming up and uh, rolling with you guys and, and meeting everybody up there in Wichita. Uh, Byron, I don't know if we've talked about it, but uh, do the people coming need to bring a gi, two gis, a couple of rash guards, and some fight shorts? Is this going to be mostly gi, no gi, or a little of both? Okay, that's a good question, Joe, and we need to start talking about that more often. Uh, I would say on June 22nd, the open mat, whatever you want to do. If, you, if you're bringing two gis, that'd be a great day to wear one of them. Uh, but if you want to roll no gi... Uh, you know, it's easy for me to take my gi top off and, and Gary prefers no gi, but I guarantee you Gary will roll with you no matter what you're wearing, as long as it's not the Speedo. He's not a fan of the Speedo. Uh, <laughs> on most people. Only I can yeah. wear the Speedo. <laughs> just, he, you're cramming his style because he wants to be the only one that has it. Uh, <laughs> now, June 23rd. I've got, a nice, I've got a nice set of bad boy shorts on my brain. Nice. <laughs> He's got the bad girl shorts. <laughs> the old school. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, on the 23rd, that'll probably be a gi day. Um, I don't know for sure, but I think both Tim and Rolly will be showing techniques that are mostly gi involved. So I would say you need to probably bring at least one gi. If you bring a second gi, we'll work with that. On the 24th, uh, the stuff I tend to teach and, and talk about, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's that's kind of one of my whole things is the things I do no gi have to work in the gi and the things I do with uh, when the gi training, I want them to also work without the gi. It does limit what I'm working on sometimes, but that, uh, I don't know for sure. If you want to wear a gi that day, that'd be cool. If not, we're you know happy to have you any of those days, uh, gi or no gi. But if you can bring a couple of them, that's great. If you could bring one, I think you'll be perfectly fine on the 23rd to wear that. That's when I would recommend it. But uh, yeah, we'll have a great time no matter what happens. Yeah, and make sure you bring a tuxedo because we're going to have an awards night. <laughs> uh, it's going to be elegant and fancy, so definitely make sure you do that. Yeah, Gary's in charge of that part. And we, you should wear bring a tuxedo in the color of your belt. Um, you know, so we should either have a white tuxedo, a blue one, a purple one, brown, or black one. Wow! Can't we? Can't we just have a cover bun? Isn't that the thing that goes around your waist and? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. A, a cumberbund, that's funny. 
Yeah. A yeah, a, a right bow guy. There you go. We got all kinds of ideas that are happening, and, and some of them will probably Joe, not happen. Yeah, Joe, you could probably make money with that. Rank bow ties and sell those. They're coming back. You know what would be cool is a tie that had, like, the, the bar and uh, the color yeah, of the tie. Like, That'd be kind of yeah. neat. I mean, I've seen the belts, Actually, like dress belts that are I think those are stuff. great ideas, Byron. I really think people would buy those. I, I would wear one to work. There you go. Yeah. I would not because I don't uh, wear that sort of thing at work. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think it'd be be too good when you're rescuing people and putting out fires to have an extra piece of clothing hanging around. Yeah, nothing extra hanging out for me. Thank you, Gary. Well, we know there's nothing <laughs> extra. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of wrapping things up on the show here, and we always like to have a little bit of bonus fun. And typically, uh, a lot of times we do this in the form of uh, improv audiobook where I'll throw a title at some guys, Gary and Joe, and see what they come up with for content. And they kind of hinted at a good one, so we'll go with that. Uh, Aging on the mat, tips and tricks from two of the best-looking older grapplers. Go go and Gary. Joe and Gary uh, sharing their wisdom from on the mats, really helping the older people uh, get away with more uh, shenanigans, maybe, or just better technique. I typically your books aren't that helpful, but they're full of clever ideas. Oh, this one's definitely helpful. Wouldn't you say so, Joe? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, they say what do they say that enthusiasm is wasted on the youth or something like that? And uh, Gary, Gary, and I are figuring out uh, ways to be more enthusiastic, even though we're older. And Gary told me recently that he bought a bottle of C four pre workout. And I think it's supposed to last uh, two months, three months. And Gary went through it in a week, but he said he got more submissions that week than ever before. How was that experience, Gary? You know, it was great. Um, the only problem was my heart rate and my blood pressure was way up, and my doctor wasn't too happy about that. But, um, you know, the, the great thing is, like, you know, my submissions went way up, and that's the most important thing. But not only submissions do me and Joe talk about in this book, we talk about escapes. And, you know, first of all, we're a little bit older grapplers, and these are tips, you know, for older grapplers to, to be more enthusiastic, to look better. Uh, you know, we don't really care so much about rolling because all that will come with, the, you know, being enthusiastic and looking better. But one thing we've noticed that has really helped our escapes is, first of all, you want really good skin. As we get older, our skin dries out. It starts chafing. Um, you know, if we have any nicks or cuts, that can lead to infections. And uh, when we're older, an infection can be, you know, worse than when you're younger. So what we do is right before we step on the mat, especially nogi, this works really great in nogi, uh, we really lather on, you know, all over our arms, our neck, uh, forehead, ears, uh, legs. We, we put on three or four gallons of lotion. And I tell you, I can get out of just about anything on those days. Yeah, that really is a good trick. And, you know, if you're like in a, in a distant type bathroom, hair products are a good idea too. Sometimes I put in a bunch of hair products. I know when I start sweating, it's just going to get slick and greasy and run down my neck. And I tell you, I haven't been choked in a long time since I've been using that technique. Yeah. And one of the things that happens to us is, you know, Joe's talking about hair products. A lot of us older grapplers don't have hair. So what we do also that works really well is we put toupees on. And the great thing is when somebody's squeezing our head and trying to choke us, a lot of times that toupee will fall <laughs> off. And the guy will stop because he actually thinks he ripped part of our head How off. How many pays? And while he's... Two pays. <laughs> two of them. Two okay. of them. Two of them. No, but yeah, a lot of times we wear two two pays because it'll get you out of two different submissions. So uh, you know, it's always it's always good to have a two pay or two uh, on hand. But yeah, so you know, that's another. You know what else, Gary? What's that? When, when I'm struggling, when I'm struggling to catch my breath, you know, I'm getting a little winded. I spit my teeth out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we don't use mouth guards. We use gum guards. But they were great. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a bunch of great tips. Um, you know, another thing we use a lot, we call it the secret choke. And uh, most people can't see it coming because what we use is we use that like 15 foot long hair that grows out of our ear. And when we got back mount on you, 
We just use that and we wrap it around and we tighten it up pretty tight and nobody sees what we're doing. But it's uh, they don't know where the choke came from. But, uh, you know, that ear hair works great for that. Wow. I, I uh, have a new perspective when I'm rolling with you guys. <laughs> yep. But uh, that book will be out shortly as soon as they decide to start making it. Uh, add a few weeks to that time and it'll be done uh, and one of the ways you'll find out that the book is done is it'll be on our social media outlets uh, Facebook Joe has really taken off and as far as uh, put a lot of interesting things on our Facebook page sometimes he'll tell a story from his life sometimes he'll just share a funny picture he's doing great with that uh, Gary and I are also I really, yeah. well let's let's go back to that I really love uh, the guard passing uh drill that Joe put on the other day. That guy had a heck of a guard trying to pass that one. Have, have you been working on that? I have, but I sprained my neck within the first minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be a young man again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that is not part of the older grapplers guide. <laughs> Just another reason to follow us on Facebook. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. We're always putting new stuff and product reviews on YouTube. And we do have a BJJ Break app. If somebody is new to podcasting, uh, I think podcasting has grown a lot in the several last several years. But still, like half the people in the country, world, whatever, don't even know what podcasts really are. You can just download the app and play it from there. It's super easy. So that's one way you can introduce it because everybody knows how to download an app. So you just tell them, hey, you know, I the app, Gary. I help you download apps. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had to have uh, my son download it for me. There you go. Well, you got it got done, which like with grappling, you find a way to get things done, and uh, that's what you did. Uh, next week, guys, it'll be the last episode of the month. Man, this month has gone by quickly, but the good news is the last week is always going to be a fun one. We have a topic episode. We'll we'll be talking about playing a tight or a loose playing style on the mat. You know, do you play a real tight game or a loose game, or do you change it? One of the good times to, to play one versus the other and different different benefits or negative things that happen when you're doing that sort of thing. Uh, there's definitely uh, room for both, and they're definitely both uh, learning tools and, and will help you grow your jiu-jitsu. It's not just, yeah, play a tight side all the time or, yeah, play super loose and kind of crazy all the time. Uh, there's definitely uh, room for both, and we'll discuss the benefits and the negatives of both of them. I think this will be a great episode to learn about jujitsu and, and developing our games. Like you said, Byron, a lot of times you'll be tight. Sometimes you'll be loose. You'll change it up. And, you know, in Byron's college days, he was really loose. But he's he's changed a lot here lately. Yep. My, my game has changed. Gary, thank you for noting that. <laughs> but as always, stay safe. They, they're saying Byron had a reputation, huh? <laughs> More than just my yeah, reputation. Yeah, more All than right. just my jiu-jitsu, Gary <laughs> and Joe. But uh, always stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better. We'll see you on the map, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian jiu-jitsu is to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Today we have episode 239, and we have a special guest, Chris Martin, on the show today. I'm here. <laughs> What's up, funny, uh, Gary? I haven't done this in so long. <laughs> I forgot what the heck I was doing. Oh, man. Sorry hey, about you're that. off to a good start. Let's start this over again. Okay. Hey guys, Joe coming to you from Texas. Uh, things are good down here, and yeah, I'm looking forward to this episode. It's all fun and games on the BJJ on the beat. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, whatever you got, I think it's contagious. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of times people do say when they're rolling with me, it's contagious. <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 give, <laughs> I'll give it another go. Hello. I'm going to just talk. I hear somebody tapping the microphone. Oh, he's gone. That's me. I lost my microphone cover. So uh, here's a, a funny, uh, I don't know what the heck, the story. Last year, I think in the fall or maybe the spring, when it was nice outside, 
I live fairly close to my parents, and we live fairly close to a Panera, the the yeah. little deli or bread place, whatever. And yeah. so we text them, hey, we're going to, to walk to Panera. You guys want to come for dinner? And they said, yeah. So we walk. It's a half mile. It's pretty nice. We get there. We order our food. And they, they you know, call, you know, Byron, your, pick, your food's ready. And I go get it. And then they, they uh, call Robert, you know, your food's ready. And he gets it. And then I go, hey, the next person that gets their food, we'll know their name. We could just say hi to them. And it would, like, probably blow their mind. And my dad's like, I'm going to do that. And so... <laughs> Uh, they so call, your dad's just like you <laughs> He's Henri But So they, they call the guy Tom your food is ready And this guy About my dad's age Walks by us Gets his food Comes back My dad goes Hi Tom And the guy goes <laughs> The guy goes Hi Robert And he just kept on walking I'm like well, What the heck just happened <laughs> it's like, They used to oh, work together crazy. They used to work together And, and he did, obviously didn't tell oh, me that so he met did, oh, he they knew each you. other. Yeah. He, oh, that's great. Yeah. I was like, man, that, my mind was blown. Oh, <laughs> what is happening? That is a good one. Yeah. He got me pretty good there. <laughs> I like that one. And they, I mean, we could have sat there for an hour and that wouldn't have been able to happen. But it just was like the next guy. He happened to know yeah. that guy and it worked out perfect. He, he's lucky that it was the next guy, you know, that somehow they didn't skip yeah. orders because somebody only ordered a bowl of soup. <laughs> I don't know what's up with Joe here. Let me just try calling him. I, I, can, I guess we should check check our phones. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Check us out next week. And don't forget to check out the archives at bjbrick.com or on this YouTube channel.